Manfred Salzgeber, who started a whole new world of theatrical exposure in the 70s in Berlin by creating new cinemas or taking over old cinemas, he has created the grounds for the development of panorama programming. Before, he was also a founder of the Forum of Young Cinema. Also there, he showed already the Rosa von Panheim film that I mentioned before. And uh, yeah, this led to a counter-program to a counter-program within the Berlinale. And since then, queer people from all around the world come to the Berlinale, like you today. And one who came very early and was there where the very first Teddy was born is Bob Hawk. He's sitting right here in the front row. Hi, Bob. Please come up. <laughs> Bob, do you know how to operate this? No. Someone else is going to operate okay. it for me. <laughs> okay, then, then we chat a little bit. Okay. Before we do that. Because Bob was his very first year at the Berlinale, right? Was it 87? It, um, 1987 was the first international film festival I had ever attended. And this was a biggie. <laughs> it was overwhelming. <laughs> yeah, this, this was, uh, for me, it was the fifth year. I'm, I'm having my 35th right now, which is like, uh, yeah. well. That's what happens when you don't die, okay? But, uh, <laughs> yeah, and uh, in that year, the group was about like 15 people, I would say, in the Eisenhardt's bookstore. 15? Yeah. Oh, well, I have a memory of a few more than that. At the end of the festival? When I oh, asked... Uh, the awards? When I, no, no, there wasn't before. We didn't have an award ceremony. I just asked everyone, what was your favorite film? Oh, well then... But it was at the Prince Eisenhurst one yes. year when there were 10-inch video monitors perched on top of stacks of books and they had something running, I don't even know what it was, and they gave out teddy bears that were little, tiny, fuzzy, real teddy bears. Okay, that might have been the second year. Oh, okay, yeah, okay. whatever. That sounds like the second year. The first year I just asked and I didn't have any bears yet. So uh -huh. um, yeah. and when I found out what would be the awards, Teto Amadova and Gas Van Sen's short film, I went and got the teddies and sent them in the mail. Ah, you yes, were, you were right. already gone you by then. You sent them in the mail that year. But, but the I, next year we did what you just yeah. said. And we were only and in... I put the one just there, by the way. Huh? You said they were given, no, we gave them, right? Uh, right, fuzzies, <laughs> fuzzies. And then after one year, we moved to Schwutz. I'm gonna listen to you, I'm gonna go back. Okay, <laughs> Schwutz, uh, which I suppose could be termed a dry queen, bar, no, hang out, a club, huh? Oh, well, when was Schwartz? Oh, you get felt. <laughs> Already I'm misremembering early history. All, all I remember is that we ended up for a while at Schwartz, and, and the teddy bears got bigger and plushier, <laughs> but they were not bronze yet. And and because the program was run by drag queens, I love drag queens, but they take forever, as we all know, and, and they provided copious entertainment. So the awards lasted for, I don't know how long, until <laughs> they gave out the final awards. So anyway, and then, uh, just to give a little history of the progress, I was going to call this from Prince Eisenhardt to the Tempo Drone. Uh, anyway, after Schwutz, I believe, was the Metropole, where Marlena Dietrich sang many years before. And it had a legitimacy that it had not had before as far as uh, 
being televised, I believe, or at least recorded. And we had our first star attraction, Jimmy Somerville. So it was at the Metropole for a while, and the early juries were very informal, very informal. Whoever showed up, and, <laughs> and so we, uh, let's say, it, it was quite loose, uh, but we came up with our awards. Uh, but by the time it, it was at the Tempodrome, the juries, or even maybe in the last years of the Metropole, the juries were invited, only one person from a country, and there was a president of the jury, and I had the honor of being the president of the Teddy jury in 2002, when it was at the Tempodrome, and any of you who know the Tempodrome, it's a 360 degree auditorium that holds 3,000 people or something like that. And that was a little bit intimidating, but I managed to speak in front of 3,000 people. <laughs> and that was kind of like the arc for me. But I, I want to talk about the early juries. Uh, they were, um, as I said, very ad hoc, whoever could make it. Panorama perversely screened the last film we had to see very late at night on Saturday night. The festival ran through Monday, by the way. And on Saturday night at the late show, we had to watch the last film and then move right over to the bikini building which exists today, has been restored, but was called the Cine Center. And the Zoo Palace, the city, Cine Center, et cetera, were the center because, of course, the wall had not come down yet. Anyway, uh, we would then stumble over to the city center at, after midnight and begin our deliberations. And we rarely left the building till the sun was rising. And there was no recognition from the larger Berlinale of the Teddy Awards. We just kind of announced them, but uh, it was not recognized until later where we are officially announced with all the other award winners. Anyway, uh, I, I don't know how much time I have left. Two minutes, oh my god. <laughs> uh, before, I'm, I'm showing a clip, <laughs> uh, but I have two more minutes to talk. So I'll just say that these meetings, which began very small, but the Cold War was not over yet. The wall had not come down. And I think if I'm going to remember one thing so vividly is the presence of people, queer people from countries behind the Iron Curtain who just by merely attending, it was brave and it was dangerous because there could have been spies, but they did attend and they shared their stories of how they could not have any public screenings at all. They had to smuggle in 16 millimeter prints, VHS tapes, and show them clandestinely in really underground basements. And I want to acknowledge and honor those people from Eastern Europe and from Russia who, who attended these early meetings and it was not safe for them, but they came anyway. And that means a lot. Um, there's a lot I could talk about. I could talk for hours, but anyway, what time? 
Okay. Okay, now, I do want to promote and acknowledge a film about me called Film Hawk. Now, <laughs> um, it is not here, uh, but I will be showing a clip from it that is particularly appropriate to the Teddy retrospective uh, films. But I do want to promote the film. It, it premiered at Sundance. It is going to be in film festivals that I can't even say anything yet. But um, DHL did not deliver the postcards in time, uh, as promised. And so I only have about four or five left, which I will put out. They look like this. There is information on the back. And I also have this, these info sheets, info sheets uh, with contact information about exhibition festival screenings and our sales rep and my business card, which also you can find out more about the film. But just to introduce the film, um, it is called Film Hawk. It is about me. I can't believe it exists, except I've now seen it with four audiences in Utah. So it does exist. Um, and it shows me, uh, well, it isn't only about me and independent film, it's about my personal life. And I'm queer, and I have been queer for a very long time. And so, the movie is quite queer, okay? <laughs> and included in the filmmakers that uh, are interviewed are uh, Rob Epstein, who I knew since he was 19 years old. And, he, and we talk about word is out, times of Harvey, milk, etc. And then Kimberly Reed, who made Prodigal Sons, uh, she is a, a transsexual who I knew when she was Paul. Uh, anyway, uh, and, and the third one is Barbara Hammer. And here is a clip of me and Barbara Hammer, and it's from the film called Film Hawk. Thank you. Over the years, I've made between 80 and 90 films that range from short experimental films about a lesbian lifestyle in the early 70s to a feature-length um, essay documentary starting about 1992. Yeah, Nitrate Kisses was incredible for me because I'd never made a feature-length film before. I'd made short films. I was tired of going out to audiences and talking about six or seven different subjects. So I decided that I'd work on a large film. ITVS was just born, and that meant that there would be representation of underrepresented groups on public television. Hey, I'm underrepresented. I know I'm white, but I am a lesbian and out. Bob Hawk was very much present at Film Art Foundation in San Francisco during this time. We all knew him and respected him as a curator, as a consultant. So when I finished, or well, I thought I'd finished my film, I decided that I would bring in maybe about six or seven different people to view on the Steam Deck the film, but individually, because I didn't want them influencing one another. Bob's response was crucial to the success of the film. Why? Because I had buried in the film probably one of the most exciting, stimulating, invisible scenes in film history, two old dykes making love, back in the film. His crucial advice was bring that forward, open with it. This made all the difference. This got the film in the Sundance Film Festival. But you know, the one thing that I'd like us to talk about is gender equity. 
I really mm. think programmers, festival directors, board of directors of festivals really needs to look at the number of women directors mm. that they're showing yeah. and the balance because it continues to be, unfortunately, a sexist industry or an industry controlled by men who are choosing films that they want to see, mm -hmm. which are often made yeah. from a male perspective. Yeah. And I just don't see that changing much in my whole 40 years of work. Um, it may be changing a little bit. Uh, so I think there's more sensitivity and a desire for, for parity. Mm -hmm. And like LGBT film festivals, mm -hmm. uh, there were the old days when really there was no parody at all, not even close. But it was also because uh, there were less good lesbian films, than, you know, because, right. because. because lesbians were not given the opportunity to learn the art. I've been working in film now for 40 years. In the early days, I showed my films in coffee houses. I had the worst experience of showing them at a lesbian bar. So I never did that again. So we tried the experience, experiments. I showed my films to lesbians at a time when I had heterosexuals in my film. I had been married. The women left. When I began an independent film, there was just gay film. There wasn't LGBT, you know, and all that stuff. But I, when I was in the beginning stages, separatism was quite prevalent and i just felt if you're in show business we're all in this together what's this separatism but there was a small faction of lesbian women some of whom were filmmakers or in the arts you know mm -hmm. and i just couldn't deal with that concept separate we're all we're all in this together. Let's put it's on okay. a show. Let's put on a show. <laughs> it's okay, Bob. <laughs> you don't understand. <laughs> and then finally, Terry Cannon from Los Angeles called me and invited me to Los Angeles to the film forum. That was the very first time I showed my films outside of the queer community. And we didn't call it that at the time. We called it the gay community or the lesbian community. And I went to Los Angeles, showed my films to a mixed audience, had a success, and found out that there was a circuit of film cinematheques around the U.S. And I began then to kind of move nationally. And Bob was crucial in pointing out to me that there were these cinemas and that this was available to the independent filmmaker. I think um, many themes that we are working with and on still today are visible in that clip. Um, how come that gays and lesbians work together? Very good question. I think it's a, a major achievement of our culture that we do. Because if you have two groups of population that would basically not need each other, it would be gay men and lesbian women. So it's a political understanding that we work together. And I think this is a, a major achievement because it has to be talked and dealt with on many levels all the time. And this is why I think it's great. The Teddy was one of the first in Germany um, procedures that called themselves gay lesbian. And uh, we had like from the beginning, of course, because we also were showing the lesbian films, less than the gay films still today. I mean, this year, for example, is a strong year for male gay films. Well, every year is, of course, a strong year for gay male films. But this year, I took it even as a focus because especially like heterosexual programmers tend to come up with strong women as a focus of their program many, many, many times. And we realize not really anything changes from that. I think the strong woman as a picture of uh, mainstream culture is part of the mainstream culture and not meant to change. Um, 
therefore, I think we have to look at the vulnerability of the male figure and bring that out as a quality uh, that might even change more. Anyways, we're working on it. It's never, it will never be finished, this kind of work, of course, as we all know from our personal lives as well from culture as such. And uh, well, thanks Bob for that wonderful moment with you and Barbara. Barbara won two teddies, uh, one for nitrate kisses, of course. And uh, yeah, it's a pity she's not here, but uh, we can see nitrate kisses in the Teddy 30 program that we have.